everyone. Welcome to episode number 576 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by you know who. Yep, that's me, Amelia Dalton. Are you ready to head to space? My guest this week is MathWorks Space Segment Manager, Aussie Sorella, and we're talking all about the intersection of AI and simulation for space applications. We investigate the challenges that engineers are facing today when it comes to the integration of AI into space applications, how simulation can be used to solve these issues, and where Aussie sees simulation with AI for space applications headed in the future. Also this week, I check out a newly discovered type of star called old smokers. So without further ado, please welcome Aussie to Fish Fry. Hi, Aussie. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. So Aussie, we're talking about AI and simulation for space applications today. So first off, what kind of challenges are engineers facing when it comes to the integration of AI into space systems? Yeah, good question. You know, this is still kind of an emerging technology in space. So for sure, there's some challenges that need to be overcome before AI will go mainstream, as you'd call it. I would lump these into to two main buckets of challenges. The first one are more technical challenges. And the second one have to do with more cultural challenges. Now, when it comes to the technical challenges, I would say that the biggest one is probably the question of how do you do verification and validation of AI algorithms? In other words, how do you make sure that you can trust your AI system when it's flying around in space? And that's, of course, especially important for any potential AI applications that are mission critical. The second challenge, technically, has to do with data availability. You know, if you think of an industry like automotive, it's relatively easy for them to collect lots and lots of data on the environment that the car drives in. You just put a camera into a car and you go and drive around and you have that data. It's much more challenging for space. Many of the places that we wanna explore with spacecraft haven't really been explored before. So we don't have a great idea of what they might look like, what the environment might be like. So availability of data is a second technical challenge. The third challenge I mentioned is cultural, and that has to do with just, I'd say, a general resistance to change from true and tried approaches. The space industry is historically fairly risk averse, and we see that changing. You know, that's been changing recently with the advent of some more risk tolerant uh, newer companies. But on the whole, there is this adversity to change, and it'll take some time for AI methods to kind of establish themselves and become accepted. That makes sense. Now, simulation along with AI can also help solve other challenges, right? Can we address the benefits that simulation and AI can bring to space applications? Yeah, absolutely. And those benefits are why this is still a hot topic in space. You know, I mentioned it was emerging, but there's definitely a lot of, of research in this area. There's a lot of interest in this area. And that's because of the things that AI can do that can't otherwise be done. Again, I see three main advantages uh, of using AI in this industry. The first one actually has to do with overcoming a challenge that I spoke about earlier, which is bringing simulation into the picture can actually help you with data availability. If you don't have data from the actual environment, but you're able to simulate that environment convincingly enough, now you can generate data through simulation that can then be used to train the AI models. So that's a big advantage of simulation. A second advantage is that AI can really help when simulating systems that are too complex or too slow to otherwise simulate. This is done using something called reduced order modeling or sometimes also called surrogate modeling. So let me give you an example 
an industry relevant example is computational fluid dynamics can be very computationally expensive. So if you try to simulate a very high fidelity fluid dynamics model, you might be waiting for a very, very long time for that model to complete. And if you want to simulate that model as part of a larger system, it may not be feasible because you just have to wait too long. But if you can build a model of sufficient fidelity that gives you the results that are still helpful, even though maybe not as accurate as the full model, but does it much faster, that can be very, very useful. It can allow you to do a lot more simulation and explore your design space more comprehensively. And AI is a great way to build that type of model. And again, the model I'm describing is often called a reduced order model. So simulation speed is a second advantage. And now a third advantage, and this is very interesting, even though it's probably the most future and forward looking, is AI can bring capabilities to spacecraft that can't necessarily otherwise be developed. So in this case, simulation might be a key enabler in this design process. I'll give you an example in the computer vision area. And I'll illustrate why it can be really challenging to design algorithms using conventional means. So let's take an example of a rover that's driving around on a different planet or a moon, and you want it to be able to uh, distinguish geologically interesting features. Say you want it to look at a rock, and in particular, identify rocks that are interesting for scientific purposes. You know, for you and me, it's trivial to look at a blob on the ground and know that it's a rock. And for a trained geologist, you know, it, it might be reasonably easy to look at that rock and say, yeah, this is actually an interesting rock. We need, we need to look at this more carefully. But picture trying to write the code to tell the rover what a rock is or what an interesting rock might be. That actually becomes really, really hard, really, really quickly. But that's an area that AI is pretty good at. So that's another application where I think AI will benefit the space industry. Granted, this is more likely to happen for non-mission critical areas first. You know, I mentioned the verification validation challenge. That still remains something that needs to be solved before you can do this for the really critical functions. So, Aussie, what is MathWorks doing in this arena? Yeah, great question. So at MathWorks, you know, we recognize that engineers working in the space industry and data scientists have the AI background. They come from uh, different circumstances. They might be using different tools to do your work. So one thing that MathWorks has been really focused on is bringing a strong foundation of AI, being able to build and train algorithms in MATLAB, which is a tool that engineers in the space industry are already familiar with. So you can think of this as kind of a, a foundation to enable engineers in the space industry to use a new technology, AI, in tools that they already know and like to work in. And we're building on that as well. So now MathWorks is developing more seamless integrations of this AI in MATLAB with our other tool, Simulink, for simulation. So what we're doing is we're trying to make it as easy as possible for engineers working in the space industry to build and train AI models that are useful for their domain and then simulate those models in Simulink with their greater system to be able to make sure that they work correctly and that they can continue to iterate on that design as needed. That's, I think, a place where MathWorks can really differentiate itself from other AI tools is this uh, seamless integration into simulation of systems like space systems, where engineers are already doing a lot of their work in uh, MATLAB and Simulink. That's fantastic. Now, Aussie, where do you see simulation with AI for space applications headed in the future? Yeah, great question. I think that this concept of reduced order modeling to enable faster simulation is likely to have a pretty strong role going forward. I, I think that's one of the areas that will likely lead the adoption of AI in the space industry. And that's simply because the verification and validation of this type of AI application is easier because the reduced order model can always be compared against the higher fidelity physics-based model. So I see these reduced order models generated by AI being very useful to explore the design space of space vehicles and spacecraft, not necessarily to replace the high fidelity physics-based model completely, but to enable more 
and faster simulation of the system to explore the different design solutions. And then once you've kind of established your design solution and you want to make sure that it's absolutely correct, you can always go back to that slower model and run your final design on it to make sure it really works. So that's a way to kind of get around that verification validation challenge that I talked about earlier. Yeah, and I do think that the other benefits that I discussed earlier, you know, generating data through simulation in order to train AI, that was the first one. And the other one is to enable new capabilities in spacecraft that weren't previously possible. I do think that those will continue to grow as well. But those will, I think, see applications first in the non-critical mission areas like I talked about. And I gave an example earlier related to computer vision that had to do with science data collection. I think that's really an ideal place to deploy and test AI algorithms because there's really no downside. If the algorithm doesn't work, you may not have collected science that you wouldn't be able to get anyway. But if it does work, you've gotten something extra that you would not have been able to get without AI. I love it. This is one of my favorite topics. Thank you so much for joining me, Ozzy. But before I let you go, it is time for your off the cuff. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there. What would you have? Oh, I'm a sucker for fish. I would go to Tokyo and have a wonderful sushi meal right now. That sounds like a good lunch. It sure does. Well, Aussie, I think that's all I have time for. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. My pleasure. Have you heard about old smokers? No, not elderly people addicted to nicotine. No, I'm talking about a brand new type of star discovered by an international team of scientists led by Professor Philip Lucas of the University of Hertfordshire. And this team wasn't even looking for the old guys to begin with. They were actually looking for newborn stars. So, in the beginning of their research, this team analyzed a decade of data from the Visible and Infrared Survey Telescope, or VISTA, in Chile. Now, this telescope is especially interesting because it watches a large area of sky for objects that have changed brightness over time. This team then narrowed down their research to investigate 222 objects that had the biggest change in their brightness. And in that group of 222 objects, about two-thirds of the stars were relatively easy to classify as well-understood events of various types. Then they took that remaining third of the objects and analyzed the spectra of those stars. Dr. Zhen Gao, who led the work on the spectra element of this research, explains the motivation of this part of the project like this. Our main aim was to find rarely seen newborn stars, also called protostars, while they are undergoing a great outburst that can last for months, years, or even decades. These outbursts happen in the slowly spinning disk of matter that is forming a new solar system. They help the newborn star in the middle to grow, but make it harder for planets to form. We don't yet understand why the disks become unstable like this. And what they found was quite remarkable. They discovered that 21 of that third of the stars, which are close to the center of our own galaxy, were changing their brightness in weird ways. One particular star, which was perfectly visible in 2010, had completely vanished by 2015, only to come back three years later, just a tad bit dimmer than before. It was then that they found something quite remarkable. These objects had not been discovered before. They were a type of ancient star called a red giant that was in the slow process of dying. But 
these stars had a unique quality that they would sometimes cough up big clouds of dust and gas that would block its light from view. And from there, they were named Old Smokers. So even though they were in the process of dying, these old smokers might be able to provide value to their younger brethren. Because since the heavier elements in the universe are forged through multiple cycles of star birth and death, these cloud burps could be a previously unknown way to spread those heavier elements through the cosmos. Professor Philip Lucas, lead author of this study, explains this aspect of the study like this. Matter ejected from old stars plays a key role in the life cycle of the elements, helping to form the next generation of stars and planets. This was thought to occur mainly in a well-studied type of star called a Mira variable. However, the discovery of this new type of star that throws off matter could have a wider significance for the spread of heavy metals in the nuclear disk and metal-rich regions of other galaxies. Wow, cool, right? So, if you want even more information about old smokers or about using MATLAB and Simulink for space applications, machine learning for space missions, or to read a new feature article by my fellow EE Journal editor Max Maxfield called... AI boldly goes behind the beyond. I've included several links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EEJournalTFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are now on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon as well. We also have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 5th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.